yet. Valentine's Day really should be more about the fact that God loves us. And so even if you're a single person um, and you say, well, I don't have a valentine. Ah, but you have something better. The king of kings, the ruler and creator of the universe, God who is perfect and almighty, loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross to give us a valentine you can't get at Hallmark. To give us a message with his own flesh and blood that he cares about us. So this is for everybody. And so even if you don't have somebody you're dating or whatever, you know, that doesn't matter. The fact is, no matter what you're like today, and by the way, just, I need to know, are there any imperfect people here today? One or two, okay, so the, <laughs> good, I'm starting to feel more comfortable. <laughs> God loves us just the way we are. I should also say, he also loves us enough to help us become what we want to be and to draw more out of us than we already are. But he loves us unconditionally, no matter what. We went through a series recently during the month of January in which we looked at our mission statement. Did anybody find it in the bulletin this week? Is it at a new spot, or did any of you get confused when you opened up the bulletin? Oh, it's in the middle. What's it doing there? <laughs> Somebody must have messed up. <laughs> I'm trying to see if you find it or not. <laughs> but but the, the mission of this church that we believe that God has given to us is that God wants us to become, or to put legs to faith. <laughs> That's a kind of cute saying, but what it means is that we want to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and right alongside of that is to love one another as we love ourselves. You can't love God without loving one another. First John actually is really clear on that. How can you say you love your brother, you love God, if you don't love your brother who you know? <laughs> okay, so love is about loving God, loving one another. Um, encouraging one another. That means we want to come alongside of one another. We want to be, be friends. We want to be supporters. It's what the Holy Spirit does, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside of us, John, Jesus says in John. He says that he's going to send this one to be there next to us so, so he will comfort us, encourage us. Uh, you ever feel conviction? <laughs> Holy Spirit at work. Okay. Um, God sends that spirit so he can come alongside of us and we need to come alongside of one another to encourage one another. It's kind of like cheering one another on sometimes and helping one another when we're about ready to give up and it, it includes the things of prayer and support and things like that. Not only do we encourage one another, but we are called to grow as Christ's disciples. That's the piece of it that we're going to take several months, I believe. Uh, we'll see how God leads, but I believe that God wants us to look at what does it mean to be a disciple. In the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, first off, it starts in verse 18 where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, that's a very important statement. Incidentally, when does he share this with the disciples? He says, I'm going to go, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've committed unto you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And when does he say that? He's on a mountaintop. He's gathered with the disciples, 11 of them, and possibly some others that are there as well. We understand from Luke that he's actually appeared to some 500 people, followers of his, after he rose from the dead. This is before Pentecost, so it's about, probably about 40 days after the resurrection. And he's standing on this, this hillside with his disciples. It's interesting, scripture says, and I believe it's Matthew where it says, so they, they come there and they're seeing Jesus, but some still doubted. And I got a feeling, you know, we would have too. And, and because what does that mean? You're standing there with Jesus and you're like, I can't believe he's here. I saw him nailed to that cross. I saw the blood pouring from his body. I saw him, his spirit, leave him. I saw that soldier 
forced that spear up in his side, and I saw the water and blood gush out. And we saw him carried to the grave, and we know he was dead. I can't believe it. I still can't believe it. He's standing here right in front of us. I want to touch him. I want to hug him. But guess what's going to happen? He's about to just ascend right up in the heavens, right in front of their eyes. Wait a second. We're not done yet, Jesus. And one more time. He says, he gives them this great commission. You see, this is a statement that he is making to his followers. And there's a couple of things that you need to take note of. The followers don't say, uh, Jesus, what do you mean? What do you mean when you said, make disciples, uh, go into all the world? Uh, could you kind of uh, give us a lesson, explain that? There's none of that conversation, is there? Why? But because they know. They've been doing it for three years with him. They understand what their responsibility is. It's not a question for them. By the way, he do, they don't ask him, you know, well, could you make sure that you kind of leave us some of the most modern curriculum? videos, something like that, so we have the tools we need. He's, you know, like, uh, they don't need that either because he's left what they need. What do they need? The Holy Spirit that's going to dwell within them in 10 days. He told them to go and wait. But there is some other piece to this that's really, really important, and that is, is that they understood that this, this is Jesus' last statements to them. Folks, if you're standing on a mountaintop with Jesus just before he goes into heaven after you spent three years with him, and he says... Make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them to obey. Do you think it's important? Oh, no. No, just a nice saying for us to keep repeating and put in churches and stuff like that, right? Oh, my. What would you say? You have moments left with the people you love. Moments. It's your last conversation. You know it's your final conversation. What would you say to them? Some of us have had those moments. Have you sat by the bedside of somebody you love who died? I remember the night, the night I sat with my mom and sang songs all night long. All kinds of songs. My sister later said, Bill, I can't believe you came up with all those songs. I said, I can't either. <laughs> but just sang all night long. Every time I'd stop singing, she'd start hollering at my stepdad, who was over in the other bed trying to sleep. <laughs> Jim, go home. Jim, go home. So I'd start singing again. Then she'd be at peace again. The tough thing was, the next morning... I left to go take our son to college, first time. And so I'm, I'm heading up a road. And I know my final, these are my final conversation. What do you say in that final conversation? I'm sure at the heart of it is I love you. <laughs> For some of us, it's, I'm sorry. For some of us, it's even, I forgive you. For Jesus, it was brothers. <laughs> We've been together for three years. You've seen it. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You know who I am is basically what he's saying. And now he says, guys, what we've been doing for three years, you go do it. As soon as you start leaving this mountain, you're going to go back, you're going to pray. He's already told them that. And the whole, you're going to wait for the Holy Spirit. But he says, then you do what we've been doing. You build relationships. You make disciples. You find people who are going to learn from you whom you are going to teach. You're going to baptize them. What's, why does he say that? Because he's not a Baptist, right? <laughs> it's because he's understood that baptism is all about a moment of repentance. A time when each person says, I need Jesus Christ. I've blown it. I've made mistakes. I need his forgiveness. 
And, and baptism, while the waters of baptism, they're not what really wash us, are they? But they're a symbol, they're a picture, they're an image that anyone can recognize. And frankly, it's an act that any of us can do because that's the other piece of this. Baptism is an act of obedience. A simple step that's easy to do. Folks, I've baptized 94-year-old lady in a wheelchair. You can do anybody. And you don't necessarily have to dunk them in a tank to have them baptized. It's just about what? It's about this water that water is so much about life and cleansing and healing. And he says, baptize them because you're going to give them an opportunity to make a statement that's out in the open, publicly made. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus died for me. Romans 6 says it so clearly. Just like Christ was buried, so we are buried with him in baptism. And like Christ rose from the dead when we come up in baptism, we're brand new people. We've been identified with a new name. And we've been made into new creations. And in Jesus' view of things, old things pass away. And behold, all things have become brand new. Praise the Lord. So he says, identify people with Jesus Christ. Identify them with me. Baptize them. But then there's this key phrase. And this is the phrase that, that I feel like we need to linger on a little bit. Teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Now, he does do a follow-up, so I'm going to jump there real quick. He says, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. So even though, bye, I'm leaving, I'm still with you. And that's a miracle that's even still un incomprehensible, that God leaves and yet God dwells with us. And that's why he leaves, because he says, I want the Holy Spirit to be, be able to be with each one of you. And while I'm here, I'm in a body. <laughs> Limited by his own choice, folks, not limited by some kind of human ability, but simply limited by his own choice. He placed himself in a human body, took on human form. The word became flesh, as John 1 says it. And he says, now, I'm with you, so I want you to teach them to obey. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. If you would, would you turn to John, the eighth chapter? And I'm going to attempt to draw from John 8 some of what Jesus is teaching about obedience. We're going to look at a rather long text, and so I obviously won't be able to go into all the details of the text. Um, that I'd encourage your study of it, your analysis of it, even after you leave here. In fact, a great opportunity if you want to... Um, take the, this word and apply it with some other Christians and even ask questions about it with some other Christians is to go to one of our life groups this week and that's an opportunity for you to really get into the word and apply the word. So John the 8th chapter we're going to look at verses 31 to 47. John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Incidentally, what a powerful, spirit-filled verse that Jesus gives us right there in that one simple statement. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Look at that in so many different ways. The alcoholic that needs to know the truth, that they're still loved and valuable and precious, but they're giving into something that's killing and destroying them. The, the person who may be angry and hostile and God's trying to say, but you're holding on to something that's keeping you in pain and you need to let go and you need to learn how to forgive or something like that. There's truth that will set us free, but we oftentimes are blind to it. And Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There's a whole message and several I probably should do just from that one verse. I apologize. That's not the focus today. The focus is what just was preceding that. And that's what Jesus says. If you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples. Then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Jesus is saying there's something very important about us holding to. There's a, it's a kind of a more gentle way of him saying of us obeying what he taught. 
Do any of you have a hard time with obeying? So, <laughs> um, I've done a ton of weddings, and I, and I love weddings. I should confess, I also value the privilege of, of funerals. Both of them give me an opportunity to minister to a lot of people, many of whom are non-believers. And they give me an opportunity to be an example in front of them. But you wouldn't believe the number of couples who when they sit down with me and they talk about the ceremony. And I talk about I want it to be a personal ceremony. Something that's special for them. And I want it, want it to be focused on them. I'm going to actually turn them and have them facing the, the people. Because I want the people to be a part of the ceremony too. And I invite the parents to come up and be a part of it. And there's just a lot of things I try to do to make it more special and more intimate. But guess what? One of the things that questions that lots of times girls ask... You you're not, in going, you're not going to include obey, are you? <laughs> you're not going to ask me if I will obey him, will you? <laughs> now, now you, you stop and think about that for a moment. Obedience that comes out of duty is depressing and a killer. When, when you're doing things out of duty, oh, I have to because God said I had to. All oh, right, that's going to be real encouragement, isn't it? When you do it because the other per, some other person said, you have to do this for me. <laughs> no, I don't. And in fact, if that's the way you're going to say it, I'm not going to. <laughs> right? <laughs> o- obedience that's done out of love, though. Oh, my You see, when I'm talking about us obeying, even spouses obeying, I'm not talking about becoming a slave or a doormat. I'm talking about the kind of response that comes completely and totally out of love. When you love somebody, don't you want to please them? Right? I mean, you kind of, I'm just going to tell you, if you didn't know this, it's better to have a smile on their face than a frown. Okay, so you want to do things that put that smile on their face. Well, I, I should admit, I don't use the word obey, and I usually say that, no, I'm not going to ask you to obey. I'm going to ask you to do more than that. I'm going to ask you to submit. I'm going to ask you to show respect to one another. I'm going to ask you to love like Christ loved you. So to the husband, and I take out Ephesians 5 at the moment, and I say, to the husband, I'm going to ask you to love like Christ loved you. And how did he love you? How did he love the church? It says that he sacrificed himself. He gave himself as this incredible offering. He emptied himself. In other passages, it says that he became a servant. He chose to become obedient to his father. Why? Because he loved us. So I said, guys, love your wife like that. And I said, ladies, guess what? He said, We're supposed to, you're supposed to respect your husband. You're supposed to believe in him. You're supposed to value him. You're supposed to hold him in high regard. It's true. I'm sorry. It's true, ladies. No great man who's out there is not really that great without that woman behind him who's really made him great. Okay? It's just the truth. And we, we as guys value the kind of respect we get from you. And I'm going to tell you this. When we don't have that respect, you can count on the fact that you're going to have a hard time accepting our love. They go together, don't they? Now, don't miss it. Ladies, should you love your husband as well? Yes. (laughs) Husbands, should you respect your wife as well? Yes. Okay. This is not a, oh, I only have to do half of it. (laughs) No, we got to do it both. But what God picks on is he says, here's the two points where it's hardest for you to do. Guys, it's hard for you to love. Women, it's hard for you to show respect. This is bigger and deeper than simply obeying. Debbie yesterday asked me to do something. (laughs) For years, I have prayed kind of different variations of this prayer. And the prayer has been something like this. God, give Debbie a husband that really loves her. I'm not praying for me to die and someone else to come along (laughs) who will finally do it. (laughs) I'm praying that I will love her the way God wants me to love her, the way Christ loves me. 
When she asked me to do something yesterday, do you know what my first reaction was? My first reaction was, yes. And I'm, I'm really serious about this. Some of you are going to say, he's lying. Okay, this time I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I'm not saying I lie other times. I'm just saying that my reaction, this was true. I said, yes. Inside here, I'm like, I started to smile. I get to do something for Debbie. And I wanted to do it. It's like, I want to. I'm a giver, and, and, and I love to give things. But see, for Debbie, she's a doer. <laughs> that's probably something about love language, but that's a whole other story. So when she said, would you do this? I'm like, I want to smile on my face. I want to do this immediately. I want her to see that this is a response of love. Yes, yes, I wanted to do it. <clears throat> teach them to obey. If you hold to my teaching, that's when you really are my disciples. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and what? Obey it. It's interesting. In our text, the verses that I'm going to try to highlight for us in these next few moments is just this phrase that keeps coming back. Hearing and obeying are really synonymous terms. In fact, one of the words in our text, it's actually the exact same words translated some places here. It's translated some other places, obey. Have you ever had somebody, you heard something you were, they asked you to do? You heard it, right? The ch children are this right like, way, right? Did you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> then why aren't you doing it? Well, you see, are they really hearing? Because to really hear is to obey. It's to take, God bless, it's to take action, it's to follow through. It's to do something about what you've just heard. Not just hear, in one ear, out the other, as we say, right? That, that, that's not hearing. Hearing is taking action, doing something about, about what you heard. So Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Well, let's go on in our text, verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. Now, what are they doing? They're going to focus on this one point that he just said, you shall be free if you... You know, know the truth, you shall be free indeed. That's what he's focused on. He's saying, look, I'm trying to talk to you about obedience. So they get off on this little tangent. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Is that true? Uh, there's a few of us who are sinners here and we kind of know that we sin and we become a slave to it, doesn't it? It beats us up, it controls us, it shames us, it causes guilt. And, and the sad thing is some of us do the same thing again and again and again. And that's even more shaming and more guilt-ridden for all of us. Or we simply kill off the conscience and then pretend that it's okay. And that's probably a more sad place to be. I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. What? They don't want to listen. I'm telling you what I've seen in the father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Uh-oh, he's going to touch a nerve here. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you to the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. Wait a second, we're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. In Mark 7, verse 9, Jesus said, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Are these people really listening to God? Jesus said to them, 
And here I want to ask you this question. Do you listen to God? Do you listen to what God says both through his word and through the Holy Spirit, which incidentally will not be inconsistent with the word? So do you listen to what God says? And when I ask you that, when I ask you do you listen, what I'm asking you is not did you hear what God said? It says a lot of things, doesn't he? Love one another as you love yourself. Here's an easy one for all of us. Love your enemy. Here's an even easier one. Forgive just the way you've been forgiven. <laughs> right? Aren't those commands that Jesus has given to us? How are you doing at listening? Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you. Do you ever complain? <laughs> ever whine? <laughs> Things get in the way of us doing what he's, the word says, doesn't it? Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God Here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Hearing, obedience, belonging to God, following what Jesus said, doing it is all about truly listening to God. By the way, could I just give you that warning Again, there's so much here in this text. So I've got to give you a parenthesis just for a moment. Don't lie. Don't, don't lie. In any way. Exaggerating all those various other kinds of things. Don't lie. Because look at what Jesus is saying. Lying comes from the father of lies. I'm sorry, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be doing what Satan does. And he says, Satan lies, and he repeats lies, and he is the father of lies. Avoid lying at all cost, and start with the lies you're tempted to tell yourself. <laughs> they may be the most dangerous. Don't lie. Let me just go back over a couple of these verses one more time. Verse 31, he said, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. He explains that one in verse 47. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Verse 51, very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Verse 55, though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I obey his word. When Jesus talks about this kind of same thought in John chapter 14 just as he's preparing to go to the cross you might want to look there in John 14 verse 15 he says if you love me keep my commands whoever verse 21 whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them Verse 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we, this is cool, we will come to them and make our home with them. Oh, wow. Verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So, do you want to find out if you love God? 
Examine whether you're doing what he says. It's a great test, isn't it? John 15, 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. 1 John, the whole letter is all about love, isn't it? It's a verse, 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. And then chapter 5, verse 3, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Today, Debbie and I celebrate 40 years of marriage. You need to give her the hand. <laughs> I married up big time, okay, big time. And um, I came with lots of baggage, <laughs> ton more. I, I had the baggage, she just got to help carry it. Um, there's been lots of stuff coming from a home that was full of violence and all kinds of stuff, uh, rage and everything. Um, I, I didn't believe Debbie loved me. It was years into our marriage before I finally believed that this beautiful lady whom I didn't deserve actually really did love me. She didn't just do it because she was trying to help the ASB president, you know, have a date. She wasn't just feeling sorry. She really cares about me. And it's because of that, I wanted to do, I want to do the things that will show her love. I was already at 2.30 this morning to run down the mountain because she was with me yesterday and I couldn't get flowers. Yeah, how do you do that when she's, when she's there, right? So I woke up at 2.30, and I'm going to go down now. I thank God that I didn't. I, I woke up again at 4, then at 4.30, and I jump, jumped up at 5. And I left the house at a, whatever it was, 5.30, 5.45, something like that. I got down there, and I found out, it's really good I hadn't gone before. Seder Brothers is closed till 6 a.m. <laughs> so I couldn't have gotten the flowers anyway, but I got them then. <laughs> Because I want to do the things that show her love. She matters to me. 40 years? <laughs> wow, we've been through this stuff. And, and I, I can tell you, I've made it hard <laughs> for her to respect me at times. But I love her. And today I'm thankful that we celebrate 40 years and a ton of memories and some special privileges and the presence of God across an, a, a journey of life. I want to do what she wants most of the time. <laughs> I want to do things that are going to please her because I love her. Folks, I love God too. And frankly, it's my love for God that helps me to love Debbie more. And more than anything else, I want to do what God wants. I don't obey because I have to. I obey because it's a privilege, because I love God. And I invite you to respond to God's love, to obey. And over the coming weeks for us to try to learn, how do we make disciples? How do we help others? So I guess I, I need to ask you a couple questions. How well are you obeying Jesus Christ? You say, well, I don't, I, I don't know what Jesus wants, so I can't obey. <laughs> you know what? That wasn't the truth. <laughs> you know something about Jesus. Whatever it is, you know something. So how are you doing at obeying what you do know? I'm not asking how you're doing at the stuff you don't know. How are you doing at what you do know? How are you doing? How well are you obeying Christ? And, and the second question, the final question of the morning, I think, <laughs> is whom are you teaching to obey? 
There's somebody and someone else. And Jesus said we're supposed to be making disciples of other people, teaching them to obey. Paul talked to Timothy and he talked about four generations. He says, okay, Timothy, I taught you. Now you find faithful men who you will entrust the gospel to, the good news of Jesus' love. You'll entrust it to them and they will train others also. If you look closely at that, that's four generations. Who are you modeling Christ for? Teaching others by your very example. And here's the fact. Whether you're doing it right or not, whether you're really obeying Jesus or not, you're already modeling the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you live your life, the way you spend your money, all those kinds of things are modeling for somebody else. They're teaching somebody else what you obey, what's important to you. So whom are you teaching to obey? I don't think the Great Commission is just for pastors. Jesus didn't use that kind of word back then. We were all the people of God. And we all are called to this act of obedience, of teaching others to obey. How you doing? Jesus, thank you for being here with us today. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that you love us even when we, when we don't obey, you still care.